We're, um, we're in the middle of a series right now we're calling Side Character Energy, where we've been walking through the life of Abraham. And, and the reason why we're calling this series Side Character Energy is, is because this is like the part of Abraham's story after Isaac was born. And one of the things we've been saying, Isaac is this child that, that has been promised to Abraham, and Abraham waited 25 years for Isaac to come into the world. And then as he's here, we have found it just really interesting like how much of a side character he has been. Like you would think that it would be more about him, but instead it seems like everything we've looked at, Isaac has played a very insignificant role. And, and that'll be the case in the text this morning too, because we won't even talk about him. Um, but the text we're looking at this morning is a text where it's interesting because it's about like a funeral, okay? And it's a funeral, it's a death. And uh, one of the things that is interesting or always fun when you get together with people in your field and you talk about things that only people in your field have experienced, okay? And so I'm a pastor and uh, we do funerals, okay? And I had this conversation with some of my friends a few, I don't know, about a year ago, and we were just, like, sharing our, like, funeral, like, crazy things that have happened at funerals, okay? And unfortunately, I haven't done so many that I have any really crazy stories yet, but fingers crossed, this is the year. Um, and so, but, but my friends had some crazy ones, okay? And, like, these are, th- these are from my friends, um, some other stories. One is this. So um, it, it was this funeral service, and, and he was getting up to do the thing. And usually the way it goes is, like, Someone will get up, they'll give like a eulogy, and they'll play a song, and there'll be a sermon, and there'll be another song, okay? So after the eulogy, the, they picked a song. And the song that they chose was the song, Turn Down for What? <laughs> yeah. He, he said, he said that it wasn't, the, the song wasn't the weird part. It was the fact that when they played it, like everyone got up and started dancing, <clears throat> Just to give you a sense, because I know that not, uh, maybe only a few of you know that, that song. This is the lyrics. It's, it's just these words. It's just these three lines. Fire up that loud, another round of shots, turn down for what? Five times. And so, like, that was it. And then my buddy has to get up and, like, speak after that. <laughs> In the club. Okay, and then that happened. <clears throat> and it's like, I can only imagine, like, the funeral home when they're, like, going over the music. They're like, I want this one. Um, and so that, that happened. Then there was another one, and he was talking about how there was a gravesite. And gravesites are, are really sad. Okay, that's where, like, those are really when it's sad. And they tend to be kind of short. And, uh, and so my buddy was telling me about how he went out there, and the family brought a boombox, which is cool. Boomboxes, you know, whatever. Um, and they would play songs that reminded them of the person, okay, the person who passed away. And the first song they played was Bare Necessities by the, from the Jungle Book, which is kind of sweet, right? That warms your heart. The, but the second song they played was uh, the Thunder Rolls long version by Garth Brooks. <laughs> okay? And, like, which is, it's a great song. But, man, I don't want that to be the song my family, like, remembers me by. That is a song about adultery and murder. Okay? Like, the long version. And it's like they're doing it, though. Okay? So that, that happened, and... Again, these pastors have to follow this up, okay? So just remember this. And then probably the one that um, I thought was maybe, probably sad, but like maybe for the sake of, it's kind of funny. Um, he was telling me that he, so during the uh, visitation, when they're sitting there, they're going through the slideshow, and the, the family picks music to play while the slideshow runs. He was at a funeral, and this family, they picked the song Highway to Hell by ACDC. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm just like, man, you don't know what hell is, man. Like, you don't want to do that. <laughs> like, what do you say in the service? Like, you know, what if that's the first one as soon as they, whatever. But that was, uh, <clears throat> that was the deal. And the lock, a lot can happen. And so we're looking at a death this morning, and there's no ACDC involved, okay? And no one's turning it down, not even for what. And so, um, but we're looking at a, at a funeral today, and it's, it's when Sarah, Abraham's wife, uh, passes away. And so we'll look at it here in Genesis chapter 23. And we'll pick it up in verse 1. It says this. Sarah lived 127 years. And these were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kirith Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went into mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So when you think about this whole side character energy idea, like Sarah's kind of experiencing that right now. Okay, so what we know about Sarah 
is that she gave birth to Isaac, her son, about 37 years ago. And what is really interesting with Sarah's story is that, like, she gives birth to Isaac, like this big moment, right? And then there's one, like, uncomfortable interaction that she has with Hagar, and then we don't see her again until she dies. Like, that's it, 37 years. It's just like, whatever. And you might be like, well, what's, so even with the number 127 of her, her years, that a lot of commentators believe that that's, the, she's the only, so she's the only one of, like, the patriarch's wives whose age is listed in her death. And they believe, they believe the reason why they did that is because they want to communicate that she had a full life. And so she had a full life. It was good. Even though we haven't seen her for 37 years, that it has been good and, and full and eventful. But probably what's more interesting than her age is where she dies. <clears throat> and according to the text, she died in the land of Canaan. And the reason why that's interesting is because, well, when you, when you die and you're buried, you tend to be buried where you're from. So I was born in Nebraska. I spent five years of my life there. And, but I've, ever since I've lived in Missouri, I'm from Missouri. If I were to die tomorrow, I would be buried in, in Missouri. This is my home. With Sarah, it's kind of complicated because so she was born in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans, and she spent 65 years of her life there. That, that her family would have been buried there, that her parents probably would have been buried there, so probably siblings were buried there. But she spent the last 67 years of her life wandering the land of Canaan, never really having a home, but living in a tent, kind of following Abraham around, doing their thing, chasing down God's promise that he gave to them. And so when it comes to her death, it's really an interesting opportunity for her and really for Abraham to, to lay claim to God's promises, that what they decide to do in death will show where they're placed in their trust. Because one of the things that God promised Abraham is that he would be a great nation and that this land that they're, that they're kind of just sojourning in would be his. And what we see as the text goes forward is we see that Abraham trusts God's promise. Look at this. In verse 3, it says, And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you, Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of sight. And the Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb or hinder you from burying your dead. It's kind of interesting. Like, so you have this, this thing going on where they're really being like deferential. And you have Abraham, you know, saying like, hey, I am just a sojourner among you. Like, would you please, like, consider giving me this, this land? Like, bowing before them. And, and th their response is really interesting because they're like, hey, you're, you're a prince of God among us. A and so it just, it, it's kind of interesting because everywhere Abraham has gone, even in people, like, these are people who are not, like, followers of God. They don't know, they don't know Yahweh. But even though they don't, it's interesting because everywhere Abraham goes, people are seeing the favor of God on his life in, in such a way that people who don't even know God see it. And, and it, it goes all the way back, that if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, God made a promise to him. And he said he'd give him land, he said he'd give him descendants, but he also said that he would make his name great. And what we have seen throughout looking at Abraham's life is that time and again, that God is making his name great. So much so that in this moment in his life where he's like, hey, I need to bury my wife. And he, he goes to do that, and they're like, hey, well, you're a prince of God among us. And, and then as the text goes forward, so he's very deferential. He's like, hey, if you have a spot, I would love to do this. Um, what comes next? I think it's actually kind of funny, but we'll look at it in verse 7. It says this. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said, if you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as a property for my burying place. So it's kind of funny. Like He's like, hey, whatever. I just would like to bury my, my wife here. Whatever is best. That'd be great. And they're like, yeah, please go for it. He's like, well, since you offered, I'd really like this one. Like It's like he's been ready for that moment, okay? Like, and, and, and I think that's actually probably a show of faith. 
that I imagine that him and Sarah were probably like in on this decision as they're walking through this land, discovering like, hey, someday I'm gonna, when I die, like this is where I'll be buried. And, and what is so interesting is you see that, that Abraham, like he's, he's kind of like savvy. Here, if you notice, it says, he's like, hey, I, I get it that you respect me. I get it that I have power. But he's like, I, I'm gonna pay full price for this. And not only does he say he wants to pay full price, but he's like, I also want to, like, do it in the presence of a bunch of people. And, and that is Abraham, like, he's being smart, he's being savvy. That, and it's because two things happen. One is if, it was one of the things I read was that if he pays full price for it, then no one will be able to take it away from him. But if it's given to him as a gift, as like a handout, then the truth is it wouldn't be very hard for the people of the land to come and take that away. Beyond that, he's also like, hey, I would like to do this in the presence of people so that everyone knows that we have made this deal. And because here's the thing, when it comes to stuff like that, man, it's always smart. Like when you're making a deal with somebody to have, like to do it in the presence of people, especially like in that culture, like it's a way of just making it more solid. <clears throat> and we do this with our kids sometimes. Um, they loved this example when they were in here at eight. So they loved it. Um, where when they tell me they're going to, they, like they want something and I don't think they like it, I will film them, and then I will make them follow through it because I'll film them, okay? So, like, one of the things that's really hot right now with kids is that the, the, the like, it's not the energy drink. Well, the energy, there's an energy drink, but, like, the sports drink Prime, okay? And it's gross. Like, it's disgusting. Like, it's made out of coconut milk. Who would do that? And so, like, we have milk from cows. It's fine, okay? But so they make this deal. And, and, and my kids, like, they want to like Prime so badly, and so, like, one time we were at a store, and we're like, hey, they're like, hey, I want this prime. Like, give me this prime, whatever, like, and I was like, if I give it to you, you have to drink all of it. And they're like, well, we love prime. It's totally cool. I was like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to film you saying that you like prime. And so when you tell me you don't want it anymore, like, I'm going to show this video to you, and you're going to, like, you're going to slam that down the gullet, okay, because I'm paying for it. This is what's going to happen. And, and so I do, why? Because, it, because if it's public... They got to follow through. They might hate their dad, but they got to follow through. <laughs> and so he's saying, like, hey, I want to do this. I want, I want people to see this so that I know that I can be, like, that it's going to happen. And then in verse 10, it goes forward and it says this. Now, Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron, the Hittite, answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of the city. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field. And I give you the cave that is in it. In the, sight of, in the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you, bury your dead. And then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. And he said to Ephron, in the hearing of the people of the land, but if you will hear me, I give you the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron. And Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So he's like, I'm, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to pay full price. And the guy's like, just take it, it's cool, what is it, we're both rich, like, it's not a big deal. And, and he's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. And one of the reasons why the commentator, Andrew Seinman, thinks Abraham is so insistent on doing this is because if he, if he gets a deal, if he gets a deal from Ephron, and we don't know a lot about Ephron, we don't know a lot about his ethics, he just kind of comes in and comes in and goes, but if he gets a deal, then he'll forever be in Ephron's debt. And he's like, no, he's going to be... He's, he's being smart. If he pays full price and he does it the right way, then he won't be in his debt. And, and Ephron can't reach out to him and be like, hey, like now that you, I gave you this, I need you to do this for me. Because Abraham's powerful at this point. There's a lot that he can do to help him. And, and it's kind of like this, like, you know, when you have a friend who like has like a trade or they're, they're good at something and, and they're like, hey, I'll come out and they'll, you ask them to come out and do something for you. And they do it for you at a discount. Sometimes that's like great when it goes well, Right? But man, when they do like a bad job or not everything that you asked for, that's very awkward, right? Because they gave you a discount. I, we, when we lived in another church we were at, 
um, someone, we, we were looking for a place to stay, and someone in the church gave us a, a, a pla- like we could stay in one of their, their pieces of property for a great discount, okay? And so we're like, okay, yeah, we'll do it. And, and they like, it was the, one of the worst situations of our life. They gave us this deal, and then she started just like showing up at our house and like just hanging out, which is awesome. It was all like she would like come over and do laundry. And, and it was like, and we felt like we couldn't say anything because like she gave us such a good deal on the property that we're like, hey, we got to do this. And, and that's, I think that's some of what he's trying to avoid is he's like, hey, I'm, I'm going to do this square. I'm going to do this the way that it's supposed to be so that you can't say that you, you owe anything. And, and so he's like, so if 400 shekels is what you're saying it costs, then I'm going to give you 400 shekels. And, and one of the things that like commentators disagree about is whether or not this is like a fair price or a, a bad price. And you can't really know for sure because, like, biblical inflation, like, we don't really know. Um, but, <clears throat> but what we do know is we do know that this was, like, really expensive. The 400 shekels that an average person would work and make probably 10 shekels a year. And so this is 40 years worth of work for him to buy this field. And, and Abraham, what he does in just weighing it out and paying for it, notice there's no haggling, no nothing that Abraham is saying, which is kind of cool. He's saying there's no price that is too steep for me to honor my wife in this way. And so he does. He counts it out in front of people. He's like, if this is it, then I will do it, and I won't do it at a discount. And then as the text goes forward, what you see is you see that um, the land is his. In verse 17, So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field and the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, it'd be funny, it's like, I'm going to give you the field, but I'm not going to give you the trees throughout the whole area, was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. And so the whole point of this, like the, what, the last verse, is really the emphasis. And the emphasis of this is that now Abraham, he owns a piece of the promised land. And even like you just think of that whole like side character energy, like, like Sarah's kind of feeling it in this text. Like she's not really feeling anything, but you know what I mean. Like she's like, she's kind of feeling it. And, and like this is a text where she dies. And, and even though that's like, what happens, it's not about that. That this text is about God fulfilling his promises to his people. And what most people see this as, is they see this as the first step of God giving his people the land that he promised to give them. And you might be like, well, man, just it's a story about a, like, a, like a tomb and a field. And it was so significant, that tomb and that field. That so Sarah's buried in there. Abraham will be buried in that same tomb. Isaac will be buried in that tomb. And then Jacob, who is Isaac's child, okay, which would be Abraham's grandson, that when he dies, he's in the, he's in the land of Egypt. He had to leave the promised land because there was a severe famine, and so he brought all of the people of Israel to, like, to Egypt. And that this tomb is so significant to Jacob that Jacob says this at the end of his life. Look at this in Genesis 49, verse 29 and 30. It says this. It says, Jacob speaking, Abraham's grandson. He says, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with a field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. Now this is, that's the text. And, and the thing is, this is a text that is about so much more than land. It's about so much more than like haggling and so much more than like ethical business dealings. But this is a text that is about God's promises. And it shows us a lot about God's promises. And I just want to look at three aspects of God's promises that we can look at this morning that we see here in the text. And the first one is this, is that God's promises don't follow our script. 
God's promises don't follow our script. You think about this story, okay? <clears throat> if you were to, like, just look at not knowing what's happened, you're just thinking about the fact, okay, God told Abraham he was going to make him into a great nation, that he was going to possess this land, that he was going to have numerous descendants, and you, I would say, okay, he's nearing death. What do you think his story's going to be like? I don't know that anyone would think this is what his story would be like. I mean, one, you have this text that's really sad. His wife passes away, which is sad and hard, and he only has one child at this point. And so he's got to be thinking, okay, how am I going to become many descendants with one child and the wife is no longer, like that, that's got to be a lot for him to, to process. Beyond that, okay, he was told, like, you're going to be a great nation, which means, like, you're going to have land. And here he is nearing the end of his life. And the land that his people are supposed to possess, all he owns is a cave and a field. That if you, like, I wanted to show on a map, like, hey, this is the promised land, and here's, like, the, the cave and the field. But it would be so small that I wouldn't even be able to show it to you. Like the dot that would say Hebron would be bigger than what he would own. That all that we know, like Abraham has become successful, yeah, but if you really were to just like zoom out, knowing everything that you know about the story, we'd all have to acknowledge that it feels pretty flimsy. Small piece of land, one descendant, like that's it. Seems like a long ways away, and it just shows us that God's promises, they don't always follow. They're, they're not the way that we would write them sometimes. And, and maybe some of you are sitting here, and, and you're thinking about your life, okay? And, and as you look at your life and you think about it, you're like, man, I would not have written it out this way. Maybe there's some, just some real pain. There's some stuff that you wouldn't have like, expected, or stuff you didn't want. Well, let me encourage you by saying that, man, God's promises that the way that God works, it isn't always the way that we work. And, and I would also say this, too, that one of the things you see from this text is that, so sure, zooming out might make you wonder what God is doing, but zooming in, you can see that God is doing a lot of things. I mean, just imagine with me that Abraham didn't have 400 shekels to buy the field. Like, that is, some, that, that is a significant thing. It doesn't feel like much, but it's something. And I imagine in your life, maybe if you're sitting here in like discomfort and pain saying, man, this is not what I would have wanted. I imagine there are little things that God is doing that you just need him to open your eyes to see. There are little victories, little miracles, little things where he has guided your steps, even though this isn't the way you would have planned. Beyond that, I would say too, that as you're, maybe you're sitting there and you're just like struggling, like don't ignore small things. Like, little steps aren't no steps. The, yeah, all he has is like a field and a cave. But that was the step that God wanted him to take. And that is the first step in them possessing the land. And so maybe you're sitting here and you're just like, I was hoping this would go faster. I was hoping this was going to be easier. I was hoping this was going to move quicker. Well, sometimes God, like, he works through slow small steps. But it doesn't mean that he's not working. I'd also say this, maybe you're sitting here and you're like, man, my life, it just, this isn't the script I would have written for me. <clears throat> One of the things is that's true, even though it's hard, is that it's in moments of difficulty where God often prepares us for what he's going to do. And, and, and the thing is, like, it might not be where you want to be, but maybe what God's doing in your life right now is he's preparing you for where he wants you to go. The athletes, they often dream of glory, right? But they get there through the preparation. And for you, if you're sitting here walking in it, maybe God is preparing you and learn from those lessons. So the first thing we see is we see that God's promises, that they don't follow our script. The second thing we see is that God's promises can be costly. That God's promises can be costly. You know, you look at this, this text, okay, and like, Abraham, like, threw down some money to get this. And what I think is so interesting about it is it's not even what he wanted. Like, it's more than he wanted. Look at, look at this on the screen. Okay, so if you notice what Abraham asked for, he's like, he's like, hey, could you give me the field of Machpelah? 
He's like, I would like to buy, or I'm sorry, the cave, the cave of Machpelah. He's like, that's what I would like. I would like this cave. That's what I want. That's where I'd like to bury my dead. And Ephron, probably being an entrepreneurial type, is like, I'll give you the field and I'll give you the cave. <laughs> Which probably made it like more expensive. And Abraham like doesn't bat an eye. He's like, okay, that's what it costs. That's what I'll do. And if you go to Abraham, you think about his life, okay, that when God called him in chapter 12, he called him on the basis of nothing that he has done. Like he just, he called him. And it was free. And it was, e- and it was great. But if you were to like look at the rest of his life, it's basically that call has cost him everything. His whole life. He's been following him. And it, it kind of works similarly with us, okay? That as you walk with Jesus, man, there's nothing, nothing more beautiful than salvation. That the God who made the world, that he walked out of heaven to lay down his life for you as a free gift that all you have to do is put your trust in him and it's yours. But as that is free, the reality is, is that after that, it can be costly. Billy Graham said it this way. He said, salvation is a free gift. <clears throat> but discipleship, well, that can cost you everything. And, and, I, and, and as you think about your relationship with God, as you continue to walk with him and do the things that he wants you to do, one of the things that becomes very clear is that it costs you things at times. You know, sometimes it costs you your reputation. I know we live in southwest Missouri, so sometimes it's, you, can, you can say you're a Christian and it helps you, but sometimes you, like, part of like, walking with Jesus is saying like, this is who I am. That, that walking with Jesus, it also costs us our relationship with sin. That, that where other people might be more willing to indulge, the truth is for us, that we're saying, no, I believe that sin leads to death, and so I want nothing to do with it. Like, it costs us. Even with, like, sins that maybe some people don't think are that big of a deal. You know, we live in a world where it's like, man, it's good to be proud, right? Where we're like, you oh, know, the Bible says pride comes before the fall, <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta deal with that. Think about stuff like coveting, right? Which is like seeing that some, something that someone else has and like wanting that for yourself. Like we have like, we have industries that are developed like, like based on our desire to want things that aren't ours, right? And, and what you see is you see like part of it is saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to go in a different direction, which can be incredibly costly. That part of walking with Jesus, like it costs us this desire because one of the things that Jesus says is he says that we should forgive Forgive people as he has forgiven us. Which, and forgiveness is like a canceling of a debt. And so part of walking with Jesus is this commitment to say that I'm not going to make people pay. That I'm going to trust that God will take care of that very thing. A lot of commentators think that Abraham was taken advantage of. A lot of people do. But him in paying the price for the field, he's saying, I'm just going to trust that God will work it out if this guy's taken advantage of me. And part of walking with Jesus is saying, I don't care. I don't care the cost. I don't care what it takes from me as long as I get to experience God's promises. And that's really what you see here in this text. And then finally you see this, is you see that God's promises are bigger than what we can see. That God's promises are bigger than what we can see. I had a mentor tell me this one time, and I think every mentor says this to their, to their whatever, they says, don't overestimate what you can do in one year and underestimate what you can do in five. Like, I think that's just like kind of part of the mentor code. Like, you got to say that at some point. And, and I, this text, it, it says that, but in maybe a little bit of a different way. It says, don't, don't overestimate what you can do while you're alive, and underestimate what God can do through you after you die. That there is a legacy that is available to those of us who walk with Jesus that goes far beyond anything that we can see. And one of the things I've loved about this study is that the, he- the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11, it gives us perspective on what they were thinking. And, and you see this here in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses uh, 8, through, 8 through 10, and it says this, talking about Abraham. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going, By faith, he went to live in the land of the promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. 
For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Like, this text, it isn't about the Gaza Strip. This text is about heaven. And what we see here in Abraham is we see what we should be doing too. The Abraham, I mean, it's a picture of, what we're, of our hope. He's saying, hey, I'm going to, to buy this cave and this field because someday this is the promise that my people are going to inherit this land. And for us, in a similar way, what we're saying is we're saying, okay, that there's a, there's a land for us that God, is, that God is designing, that God is preparing. And what we need to make sure, the way that we respond to this text is making sure that we are doing everything that we can to make sure that we're ready for that land that's coming our way. And that's heaven. And so the first question that you've got to ask yourself is this, and this is a, this is a text about a funeral, but the first question is, okay, am I ready to die? That, that if, if, if this was my story, if, this was about, if, I, if it wasn't about Sarah, but it was about me, would I be ready? Have I stored up my treasures in what is coming, or am I so fixated on what I can see? And then beyond that, if, if we're like, no, I'm ready, this is what my hope, my hope is in that, and then the next question is, okay, what am I doing to lay up treasures there? What am I doing right now that I believe is going to outlast my life? Because everything that you do for him will we're made to live forever. Let's pray. God, we love you. And God, we're thankful. We're thankful, God, that you have a place for us. You do. That there's a land that is ours. And God, by your grace, our hope is that we would live there forever. And I just pray for my friends in this room and those watching online. God, I pray that, that we would be ready for that. I think one of the things of this text that it shows us, it shows us that death comes, and that how we handle that shows whether or not we're ready. And so, God, I just pray for everyone that they would look at their life and ask, have I, have I done that? Have I made myself ready for that moment? Is my hope in Jesus? Do I believe that he has paid the ultimate price so that I could have a relationship with him forever. Do I trust in him? And God, if there's anyone in the reality of their circumstances that they don't have that, then I just pray that in this moment, God, that they would put their trust in you. They would say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I make you the Lord of my life. And then I pray for everyone else, God, that, that they would look at their life and see that it's so much bigger than right now. That God, it's so much bigger than what we can see. And that you would help all of us to store up treasures in what you're building for us, God, someday. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us for service online today. And if you feel called to give at New Life, there's two different ways you can do so. You can text the number 84321 with the amount that you would like to give. Or you can go online to giving.nlspringfield.com. And we would love to see you here at New Life in person sometime. And when you're here in person, the best way to connect with us is at Party with the Pastor. It is the first Sunday of every month, and it is a party. We've got games, snacks, giveaways, and you'll get to know New Life just a little bit better. We would love to see you in person. We have services at 8, 9, 30, and 11. We would love it if you would join us.